Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue what we did in the previous video, where we looked at a bunch of these figures and just identified a bunch of structures. Okay? But in those videos, we actually looked at anterior views. Now we're going to look at a lateral view of the anterior neck muscles, and then also a cross-section at the level of the C5 vertebrae. All right, so let's go ahead and keep going with this. So let's look at muscle A right here. And by the way, we're looking at the right lateral side of the body. So here's A. This is, of course, the trapezius muscle. Remember, the trapezius is mostly a posterior superficial neck muscle. However, on the lateral sides, we can see a little bit of it sneaking through. And so here's our trapezius right here. All right, B is this muscle right here. This is actually another one of our posterior neck muscles. This is actually splenius capitis. Recall that splenius capitis was in the deep layers of the posterior neck. There was splenius capitis and splenius cervicus. Capitus was the one that actually inserted on the occiput, went all the way up to the base of the skull, and it was involved in neck extension. Okay. C is this muscle right here. Okay. C, remember, is a little bit deep to the trapezius right here. This is going to be levator scapulae. And again, this one's going to be originating from some of those upper cervical vertebrae, that is the transverse processes, and then it's going to extend downward and insert on the scapula. And really it's going to be inserting on that superior part of the medial border. All right. D is right here. You should know what this is. This is sternocleidomastoid. Again, we can tell that it's sternocleidomastoid because not only does it have an origin on the manubrium of the sternum, but if we follow it upwards, it inserts on the mastoid process, which is actually pretty much right behind the ear. This is actually your external acoustic meatus, this hole in the side of your head. And so this would be the opening to the ear canal. And so the mastoid process is directly posterior to that. So this is sternocleidomastoid. This is actually going to be uh, the sternal head right here. The clavicular head is right here. So the clavicular head recall is going to originate on the, on the clavicle, but as it goes up it fuses with the sternal head and they both insert on the mastoid process. All right, now for some anterior neck muscles in the deeper layers. Right here, E, this is going to be sternohyoid. So first of all, here's your hyoid bone right here. So all the muscles beneath this, these are going to be your infrahyoid muscles. This one, E, is sternohyoid because if we follow it downwards, we, we can't see it, but we're assuming that it originates on the sternum, okay? And then it's going to move upward and insert on the hyoid bone, so sternohyoid. Now, right here, okay, this line right here, this is the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage. Now, we really can't see the thyroid cartilage in this view. But this is going to be the oblique line of that thyroid cartilage. So F right here is going pretty much from the sternum, we assume, okay, all the way up just to the thyroid cartilage. So F would have to be sternothyroid. Above that is G. This one is actually originating from that oblique line on the thyroid cartilage and ascending up to the hyoid bone. So this one would have to be thyrohyoid. Okay. If you look at these figures and you just reason through the names, a lot of them you can get, or you can get at least close to getting, especially if it's multiple choice, just by reasoning through where the origin is and where the insertion is. And just note that for all of these uh, suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles, as long as one of the attachments is the hyoid bone, that is always the insertion. Okay. I can even go back to this table that I made in one of the previous videos. Notice that if it has any attachment on the hyoid bone, then that is going to be the insertion. Okay. The, or, the origin is never the hyoid bone. The insertion is the, always the hyoid bone if it attaches on the hyoid bone. Okay. So G was your thyrohyoid. H is omohyoid, right here. Now this is a two-bellied muscle, so this is the superior belly of omohyoid inferior bellies down here. Remember that they both are fused at an intermediate tendon, both bellies. Intermediate tendon would be uh, deep to, I should say, the sternocleidomastoid, so we can't see it. But coming from the clavicle, there would be a fascial sling that would hold that intermediate tendon. 
and force this muscle into this bent shape like this. So here's the superior belly of omohyoid. Here's the inferior belly of omohyoid. I, which is right here, is the digastric muscle. Digastric meaning two bellies. Again, this one's very similar to omohyoid. Here's the anterior belly of digastric, and the posterior belly is right here. Notice again they have an intermediate tendon that fuses the two bellies, and here you can actually see the fascial sling coming off of the hyoid bone. This structure right here in my mouse is, that's the fascial sling coming off of the hyoid and sort of looping around that intermediate tendon of the digastric. And again, that forces the digastric into this bent conformation. Okay. Let's see, the next muscle is J stylohyoid. That's this thin muscle right here. Again, right beneath the external acoustic meatus and a little bit anterior, we have this structure called the styloid process of the skull. Notice that the origin of the stylohyoid is on the styloid process. It's a thin muscle, and as we follow it down, it inserts on the hyoid, so stylohyoid. K right here is going to be the mylohyoid. Remember, that's a broad muscle that's going to be a little bit deep to the digastric. Okay? So again, if we look at this picture, we saw here's our mylohyoid, and here's our digastric anterior belly. Notice the mylohyoid is deep to that. We can even see that here in the lateral view. Okay, So K is mylohyoid. Now for the scalenes, we can see those really well from the lateral view. L is the anterior scalene right here. M, posterior to that, is the middle scalene, and N is the posterior scalene, okay? or scalenes. Now here we have this little space right here. This space is called the interscalene space, and we brought that up in several videos. It's a little space here between the anterior and middle scalenes. And it's even pointing out the brachial plexus right here. The brachial plexus will actually come through that. We can see it, and then we can also see the subclavian artery. The subclavian vein does not go through this space, okay? only the artery. P, this muscle up here, which we haven't really gotten to yet, unless you've watched the facial muscle playlist or video, this is the masseter muscle. The masseter muscle is involved in closing the jaw, but it is not a part of this anterior neck musculature. It's just here for reference. Down here, Q, this is our pectoralis major muscle, and then R is the deltoid muscle. All right, here's an imposing looking cross section of the anterior neck. It's at the level of the body of the C5 vertebra, and it's asking us to identify again all of these muscles right here. And then also we're gonna be identifying some arteries, nerves, and veins. Now, when you first look at this, it might be tempting to panic, but if you follow the rules that we've talked about in some of the previous videos, and including the beginning of this one, you should be able to figure out a lot of this. Okay, first of all, let's identify some landmarks. Okay, here's the body of the C5 vertebra. It gives us that. Okay, we can see a couple of things. This is actually the vertebral foramen. Okay, and we know that because we have the spinal cord in here. This is the spinous process of C4. The reason it's C4 is remember the spinous processes kind of descend downward. So the vertebra above this is C4 and the spinous process would project a little bit downwards, and so you'd have a little bit of that spinous process here at the level of the C5 body. Okay, we've got a few other things. First of all, this structure right here, this is the thyroid cartilage, okay? Um, back here would be the cricoid cartilage, although we really don't care about that. I really just wanted to point out here the thyroid cartilage, because that's gonna become important in a little bit, okay? All right, so let's start identifying some structures. All right, so first of all, A is back here. Well, A appears to be a superficial muscle, and it appears to be in the back. How do I know it's the back, or this is posterior? Well, if this wasn't here written, I would know it's posterior because this is the spinous process, right? Also, this is the body of C5, and the body of the vertebrae are anterior. So this has to be posterior back here. So the superficial posterior muscle, this would have to be trapezius, okay? Now B is this muscle right here. This is B, okay? Now B is actually gonna be splenius capitis. It's one of the splenius muscles. Remember that the splenius muscles actually are going to originate right here on the transverse processes of some of these uh, upper cervical vertebrae, and then they're gonna descend upward. 
And remember, splenius capitis actually goes all the way up and inserts on the occiput, right on the base of the occipital bone of the skull. Okay? And so notice that from its origin right here, it's actually going posteriorly, which is going to allow it to insert on the occiput. So B, this is definitely splenius capitis. Now C right here is levator scapulae. And we're actually going to use levator scapulae as a landmark in a few minutes when we look at the scalenes. But just note this is levator scapulae. Now D, D is this very long, broad muscle. It goes all the way, really at the level of levator scapulae over here, all the way around anteriorly, and then to the other side. This is platysma. Remember, platysma is that broad, sheet-like muscle. Here's platysma from a previous video. Uh, notice that it goes all the way around the neck, and it's been cut on this side, but it goes all the way around, and it's a very thin muscle. So that should clue you in that D is platysma. Also, platysma is in the superficial layer of the neck, so it's platysma. E is not labeled, but it's this muscle right here. So E, it's a pretty large muscle in the anterior neck, and so the largest one is going to be sternocleidomastoid, okay? Also, sternocleidomastoid is a little bit lateral, okay? If we actually look at its position here in the neck at about this level with the thyroid cartilage, notice that it is fairly lateral on the neck. Remember, we're looking at a cross-section, and we went right through the thyroid cartilage. So we're at this level, roughly. So the sternocleidomastoid is fairly lateral at this level. If we cut it down here, it would be more medial but up here it's a little more lateral. So this one that's not labeled is technically E, this is sternocleidomastoid. All right, now we're looking at muscle F. And we've got four muscles right here. These are all gonna be muscles in the hyoid layer of the anterior neck. We need to be really careful here because uh, we could easily confuse these. But if we follow some rules from one of the previous videos in the hyoid video, we should be able to identify these pretty well. All right, now we need to ask ourselves, are these going to be suprahyoid or infrahyoid muscles? Well, remember, here's our thyroid cartilage. So we cut this at the level of the thyroid cartilage. So we cut it approximately right here. Well, the thyroid cartilage is below the hyoid bone. So if we're at this level, these all must be infrahyoid. We're not going to have any suprahyoid muscles in this cross section. They're all going to be infrahyoid. Okay, so all four of these, F, G, H and I, these are all infrahyoid. Now another thing that we can do is we can go back and look at this. Infrahyoid muscles are in two planes. We have a superficial plane and a deep plane, which means the superficial muscles are going to be sternohyoid and omohyoid. Deep muscles are going to be sternothyroid and thyrohyoid. Okay, so let's actually go and take a look at these. So which ones look like they're more superficial? Well, to me, F and I look like they're the more superficial of the two. H and G right here look to be a little bit deeper. They're actually closer to the thyroid cartilage. So I'm going to say F and I right here are going to be superficial. Now, out of these two, since they're superficial, one has to be sternohyoid and the other has to be omohyoid. Well, F I'm going to say is sterno hyoid, and the reason for that is because it's closer to where the sternum would be. I is a little bit too far laterally to attach to the sternum, most likely. So F is closer to where the sternum would be. Of course, the sternum would be more inferior, but again, this is closer to the sternum, so I'm going to say F would be sternohyoid. I would therefore be omohyoid, and we can even confirm that with this anterior view. These two muscles right here, these are the sterno hyoid, which is a little bit medial, and the one that's a little more lateral is omohyoid, okay? So again, in this cross section, the lateral one is omohyoid, the medial one closer to where the sternum is going to be, that's going to be uh, sternohyoid. Now for these two deep muscles right here, the more anterior one, H, is going to be the thyrohyoid. The more posterior one, G, is going to be the sternothyroid, okay? Now for the scalenes, we can actually use letter C here, the levator scapulae, as a reference point uh, for identifying these. Now, in this level, we're not going to have the posterior scalenes, okay? We're only going to have anterior and middle, but the scalenes in general have to be anterior to the levator scapulae. So K would actually not be posterior scalenes, K would actually be the middle scalenes. And then J right here, this would actually be anterior scalenes. What is L right here? 
L is actually going to be in the deepest layer, and that's going to be the longest Kali muscle. Notice that the longest Kali muscle is directly anterior to the vertebral body on either side, left and right. Okay? If we go back to one of the previous pictures, we can actually see that. Notice the longest collie runs right over the anterior surface of the bodies of these vertebrae, just lateral to the midline where we have the anterior longitudinal ligament. If you want more uh, detail on that in review, go back and watch that video in this playlist. Also, another thing that's important, if you look directly anterior to uh, the longest collie, we're actually going to have a couple of important nerves right here. Okay? And that's actually what we're going to look at right now. We're actually going to go through these nerves and arteries and veins and just identify them. So here, N refers to nerve, A is artery, V is vein. So let's first identify N1, so that's nerve 1. All right, I've zoomed in here a little bit so we can see this better. So N1 is this one right here in yellow. What is N1? Well, N1 is actually going to be the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. Out of these three nerves that we're going to see, notice the vagus nerve is always the most lateral. Okay, And the vagus nerve is actually going to run between this artery right here, which is actually going to be the common carotid artery. We'll come back to that. And this vein, which is the internal jugular vein. The vagus nerve runs right in between those. It's the most lateral of these three nerves. N2 is this one that's kind of in the middle. It's also anterior to the longus colli muscle. N2 is going to be the phrenic nerve. Remember the phrenic nerve originates from roots C3, 4, and 5, and then it's going to innervate the diaphragm. So it's a major respiratory nerve. I should say inspiratory because it causes contraction of the thoracic diaphragm. N3, which is right here, it's in the transverse foramen. This is actually going to be the C5 spinal nerve. Okay, this is the C5 spinal nerve. N4 right here, which is also anterior to the longus colli muscle, this is going to be the sympathetic trunk, which actually flanks the vertebral column on either side anteriorly. And so these are a bunch of ganglia that are connected to one another and run down the length of the body, um, and they're going to provide sympathetic innervation to a lot of the thoracic organs and abdominal organs. So those are some important nerves in this area. Let's move to some of the arteries, A1. This large artery right here, I've already mentioned it, this is the common carotid artery. This is going to bring blood ultimately up to the head. Now the common carotid artery at this point has not yet divided into external and internal branches or external and internal carotid arteries. But lateral to that, that was our vagus nerve, and lateral to that is the internal jugular vein. Okay? Notice the internal jugular vein is larger than this one, V1, which is the external jugular vein. Also notice when we compare these two, the internal jugular vein is obviously a lot larger, but it also is inside the anterior neck musculature. That's why it's internal. The external jugular vein actually lies outside the anterior neck musculature, with the exception of the platysma laterally. Okay. Now if we look at A2, A2 is actually right here within the transverse foramen. This would actually be the vertebral artery, which again is going to ascend up toward the neck and then fuse with the contralateral vertebral artery into the basilar artery, which helps serve structures in the skull, i.e. the nervous system. And then A3, which is right here, this is the ascending cervical artery. A4, which is over here, is going to be the superior thyroid artery. And then these two veins, again, this one's the external jugular vein, which lies outside of the anterior neck musculature, except for the platysma laterally. And then V2 right here is going to be the internal jugular vein. And again, the internal jugular vein and common carotid artery flank the vagus nerve on either side. Okay? So hopefully this video made sense and gave you some good information about the oncovertebral joints. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.